thanks so much for joining us uh, here at Illinois State University and the Department of Health Sciences in our 2024 Annie Nolte Scholar presentation by Margaret Moore. My name is Jim Broadbear. I'm a professor in Health Promotion Education Program here in the Department of Health Sciences. I wanted to just tell you real briefly about our department uh, and the programs that we offer. It includes an online Master of Public Health program. And then at the undergraduate level, we have programs in public health, school health education, and integrative health and wellness. And that integrative health program includes our program approved uh, health and wellness coaching program. The Nolte Scholar Program started in 2001, and our first scholar was John Seffron, who at that time was the president of the American Cancer Society. He had actually been a student of Dr. Nolte, so there was a neat connection there in that experience. The Scholar Program was funded by Dr. Nolte after her retirement in 1997, and I and my colleagues were pleased to spend a lot of these occasions with her uh, during those years, up until uh, when she passed in 2009. So uh, her legacy continues with our event today. Dr. Nolte was a pioneer in health education. She came to ISU in 1973 to start this program. Uh, but by that time, she had already established herself as a leader in the field. Uh, she and colleagues uh, did foundational work to establish the, the value of health education taking place in schools. And as I said, she carries on that legacy as well. We've had many distinguished scholars over the years. And when my colleagues and I started discussing bringing a scholar in health and wellness coaching, Margaret Moore immediately came to mind. As many of you know, she's the founder of Well Coaches School of Coaching. And I and thousands of others have received our coaching education through that program. Uh, I have a dog-eared copy of the coaching psychology manual in my office, uh, and I use it in my own teaching as well, Margaret. So um, she's also the co-founder of the Institute of Coaching. It's a global force for the, for the field and co-founder of the National Board for Health and Wellness Coaching. So in short, I think it's fair to say Coach Meg has been instrumental in pretty much all of the major developments in the field over the past 20 years. So with that, I am honored to introduce our 2024 Nolte Scholar, Margaret Moore. I will stop sharing. Uh, well, well, thank you, Jim. It's an honor um, to be with all of you and um, feel free to put your camera on if you, I see a few of you do. Um, so that we can share our smiles. I appreciate that. And, um, you know, Jim, it's a particular honor because I am not a PhD or an MD. And so I don't know how many other scholars um, are like me that haven't got terminal degrees. Um, and, you know, if I had time, I probably would. <laughs> but um, so I'm just, I really appreciate that. Um, because when I started in coaching, um, there weren't any coaching scholars in this country. Um, there were just a couple of us, you know, Tony Grant in Australia and um, the British Psychological Society. So one of the reasons I was able to, um, you know, kind of be part of the scientific movement in coaching is just because I was there early. And, and I had come out of the biotechnology world, which, so I was not, a, a, I was close to science. I just wasn't a scholar. So I just, it's just a huge, a huge um, gift to, you know, to be welcomed um, as the Ann Nolte Scholar. So I'm going to um, take you through um, some slides and um, Jim gave me permission <laughs> to make this not a pure lecture. I hope that I'm not the only one that's done this. Um, so I've got three parts. Um, I, I did read the 1998 interview, which I think is about 10 pages on Ann Nolte, which was fascinating. Um, and I, I wanted to just talk a little bit about her journey and my journey together. So that's the first part. The yeah. second part, um, is the, the heavy lifting to building a field. Um, 
where I've really used my, you know, MBA corporate skills. So I, I want to just tell you a little bit more about that. And then, and then my heart's in part three, which is the coaching insights, which I will, it won't be a full review um, of coaching science. I'm going to focus on what I find really important and interesting right now, um, because there's lots written and lots of presentations out there. So that's my plan. I hope you like it. <laughs> if you don't, let me know and I'll come back and do something else um, that, that you do like. So that's the plan. So, so first, um, Anne, Dr. Nolte, um, was a career hopper and um, which I was too before my coaching career um, and saw career as an enabling process of her own evolution as a, as a, um, contributor and leader. Um, she was really interested in um, the human dynamic of growth and development. So education was in many ways the front for that, I think. She saw people as whole beings more than health. She was a pioneer both in teaching health education in schools and then turning health education into a, a profession. She helped define health educators, the standards of collaboration from the 70s on. And is a, I've been working with NCHEC actually, um, which I'll show you. She had diverse interests. She was known uh, for her interest in history and philosophy. And then some of the cooler, more um, um, front frontier areas of science, it's like psychoneuroimmunology. And she was the first woman dis distinguished professor at ISU. Um, I'm gonna tee off that one because um, Dr. Nolte was one year older than my mother. And so when I read this, I and, and you'll see, here's a picture of my mother. You'll see there is a similarity. Here's a woman, the same generation in Canada, but my mother was a nurse, uh, moved into education, taught at Teachers College and, and landed in a very senior education role in the provincial government in, in Ontario and in Canada. She was the main breadwinner of my family. And um, and so I I mean it brings honestly it brings tears to my to my voice uh, as much as much because my mother similar smile and what but was behind that smile though was my mother dealt with all kinds of awful sexism. I mean it caused ulcers. It was really a tough career and Dr. Nolte doesn't talk about that and I don't know Jim whether that was part of her experience and she just sloughed it off and said, I'm not going to worry about it. But just know that women of that generation did not have an easy time getting to the top. Um, and then my grandmother, who escaped from the Ukraine 100 years ago, um, from Russians taking over the Bolsheviks, taking over the, the Russian German Mennonite fam, a farm. So she was a refugee in Canada, started with nothing, you know, and you can you can just see how fierce she was. Here I am at age 20. I'm pretty, <laughs> pretty. Uh, you know, um, new to leadership, you know, compared to these two very strong women. And so I just want to, I just want to say, I'm very aware that those of us who are women leaders, although we all, we need strong leaders everywhere, we still have a big role to play as women leaders in forging ahead and helping other women see their, that way. The second thing about Ann Nolte is that she talks about, you know, what influenced her with the era that she grew up with, how she really deliberately chose the universities that she spent time with, her hero, physician Albert Schweitzer. And then I'm going to tee off this. She she lived in, even though she didn't come from Washington, D.C., she spent time there so that she could live within and be surrounded by the national and international influences there. And, you know, I left Canada when I was 25. Sorry. This is, um, I put my phone somewhere so I could see it and it made a funny noise. So um, I went off to England at age 25 after my MBA, which was not something many people did back then in 1983 and finished my MBA at London Business School. And, and as a Canadian, I couldn't get a green card in the US. I had really no way into the US. I, I eventually married in America and that's how I got to be here. And, um, and so I, I tell you this because I think it's really important to have this global view. I've lived in four countries, um, briefly in France, uh, UK for six years, Canada for, you know, up until my 30s and then uh, 40s, actually, and then um, in the US since 2000. So 
that speaks to the, you know, the, the, the notion of really expanding your horizons. Dr. Nolte was deeply grounded in her values, humankind, integrity, loyalty. These are her words, love, faith, hope, freedom, and responsibility. And no doubt that shone, uh, shone through in everything that she did. And the story I want to relate on this is my dad, who was a farmer. Um, we did leave the farm when I was eight. Um, but he was a farmer for many years. And um, he told the story that there were three kinds of farmers. Um, the ones that were really good at business, buying and selling things. The ones that were really good fixing engineers, they could um, fix tractors and machines and you know were able to buy and sell equipment. And that's what made them successful. And the third kind of farmers were really good with the animals. And that was my dad. And we had a hundred dairy cows. And the way that you're successful as a farmer who loves your animals is that they produce more milk. And I know that's a far cry from coaching, <laughs> but there is a similarity here in that my dad loved his animals. And you can see this is a whispering horse. This horse was very, very close to my dad. So that shows that um, these values travel family, through family, then um, I think Anne could be properly described as an authentic leader. Um, as a person, your personal characteristics have to come across wherever you are. I don't feel you can have a separate personal life and a separate professional life. And the one thing I want to, you know, share here is that 10 years after I got my MBA, I had made it to the C-suite in my mid thirties. I was the CEO of a vaccines biotech company in New York state. And I'm, I, I do need to spend some of my time um, leading, which is why it's come natural to start things up, to pull people together, to understand the corporate you know, law and all the things that go into that. And so I'm not the same person as I was then because I wasn't a coach then. That brought out an entirely different side of me. But there is this, I, since that time, I have been in C-suite roles and it is very, and I'm I'm actually a businesswoman. I mean, more social uh, entrepreneur than, than, you know, I didn't go into investment banking. I didn't, I didn't go into work at McKinsey. I didn't do the, uh, the, uh, the many things that, C, that MBAs do. Um, but that's still very much a part of me. And I, I use it. I use it now. I use it all the time, not every day, but it is definitely part of who I am. Whole person. So Anne said in health education, we work at education of the totality of the being through the physical, the mental, emotional, and the social. Now, where I've taken this is pretty deep. Um, I spent several years, four years getting trained in internal family systems therapy, which helped me um, um, uncover uh, what I call strengths-based multiplicity of mind. There's a book I've written, uh, um, co-authored a book on this. Um, I consider this legacy work that hasn't yet fully matured, um, partly because it's very hard to study, um, but I have taken it to a deep place. I spend an hour a day. So what I basically uncovered in myself and then have mapped it to all the main personality models at this point, that's not been written up yet, but it's part of my coaching work, is that we really do have a, a number of parts in our personalities that are full of opposites, full of um, different agendas, strengths, needs, um, talents, um, functions, that all come together to make our core selves. It's really pretty complex. Um, and the more you start to play with this, the more you start to meet the different parts of you, because they all get, you know, early on, they get pretty sculpted into an identity. And sometimes you lose some of these parts, you know, you have them all when you're young, and then you begin to lop some of them off as you develop your identity. Like it, my identity as a CEO, it's very strong in the standard setter, the achiever. But what I didn't know until I started coaching is that I was also equally strong at, at the introverted intuition, which is me making meaning, which is what I use as a coach, the intuition to, to sense where to take a conversation. And a lot of these other parts have been used more or less for me in my life. And I think the more that you begin to understand this complexity, 
the more the more you let go to being in charge first and also just appreciating how much of you is not yet discovered next anne um was deeply committed to scientific research that health education was much more than the initial topics nutrition drugs human sexuality safety exercise that it that it is continually evolving and that we really need to continually bring it into the work of health education as well as coaching it's something to be aware of, to stay in touch with, to, to, to extend your interest in research beyond um, the, what is, what is uh, underlying today's competencies and curriculum. So I wanna share um, a piece of research that is absolutely brilliant, that is very recent, coming from uh, Steve Hayes, who's well known for developing um, acceptance and commitment um, practice and therapy, which has more than 100 randomized control studies. This is new work with um, Joe Cariocci. And what they did is they took the entirety of, of the literature around the main clinical psychology interventions, you know, CBT and on, and, and then the entirety of the positive psychology interventions. And they dissolved so there, there's lots of packages, packages of, of processes, like these things are multi-step packages. They took the connective tissue away, dissolved out the elements of all these um, packages of processes, and then organized them into six psychological change processes that are common across clinical and positive psychology. And then I took the well coaches uh, interventions and elements and map them across these six, just to show you that it's possible for coaching to touch on all of these six processes. So there's self, you know, relating to self-esteem, efficacy, competence, attention, where you focus your attention, where you focus your attention in a coaching session through the question you ask, the way you reflect motivation, lots of different elements around motivation, how to deal with emotion, how to deal with cognition and behavior. And basically, when you look at what we do this way, you realize that in a session, you're actually uh, ten attending to which process you think needs to be focused on right now. And then knowing that if it, you think there's a need for more motivation or a different thinking or um, a productive way of dealing with emotion or uh, uh, behavioral or self, whatever it is, then you know you've got all these different processes you can use. And then you get to choose in the moment, which is the right one. And when you have that kind of map and you have all of these options, you've got a much better chance of, of unlocking the right process with the right um, approach in that moment. That is beautiful piece of work. That is, I mean, if you read the papers, you they, you'll they'll blow your mind. It is such an amazing body of work, and it's applicable to everything people do in the helping professions. Okay, so that was part one. The 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 journey. I wanted to talk about Ann Nolte's journey and share a little bit about mine. Now we're going to talk about building the field, and. Um, I always think about this picture um, when I'm about to, you know, climb some proverbial mountain because um, also uh, in my just probably just just after my time with Virogenetics, when I was the CEO of Vaccines Biotech Company, I went to the Arctic Circle. So Baffin Island is next to Greenland. Um, not, if you're not Canadian, you may not even have heard of it, but it's this big island next to Greenland and most of it's above the Arctic Circle. And so I chose to join a, a, a hiking trip with about, um, I guess there are 12 of us, to spend 15 days carrying, this pack is 55 pounds, I weigh 107. So that's a lot of pack for 15 days. In fact, when I first put it on my back after we got dropped off at the, by the little plane, I fell over. I actually went over like a turtle on my back. I thought, how am I going to carry this pack for 15 days? We were carrying it over these boulder fields. I mean, I don't recommend this for most people. It was really hard, really hard. You know, we were carrying everything for 15 days. I mean, the, the hardest moment was when we were coming, going across a fast moving Arctic stream. Okay, this is snow, uh, snow melt. It's cold. We're up to our 
necks in water and we're, I wasn't, cause I wasn't tall enough to do this. We're passing the backpacks across this, you know, maybe a hundred feet of a river um, in a chain, you know, and then of course, you know, and then it's cold, right? So then you get out of the cold water and then you, so, so anyway, I don't recommend this trip particularly, but, um, but I do, I do believe that doing hard things is a really good thing and big things don't happen unless you do hard things. And so when I look at this list of the four things, four organizations really that I have been building with a new one underway right this minute, um, it was a, it's been a lot of work over the last 20 years, you know, starting well coaches. So for the first nine years, that's all I did was build well coaches, working, building the team, building the coaching protocol, building the manual. And then as of now, with my much larger team doing almost all of the work, we're up to 15,000 coaches in 50 countries. And then in 2009, we started um, the Institute of Coaching, which is living in the McLean, it's at McLean Hospital in the Mass General Brigham, which is a $11 billion, you know, 15 hospital um, healthcare system. Um, and that's a, you know, that's a day or two a week as well. And then in the year later, a gang of us started what became the national board. Um, because of my corporate background, I was able to help design the, the partnership with MBME, the multi-million dollar investment, you know, lay down, you know, all the legal um, um, paperwork to create a new entity. And then for the last, then for five years, I led the healthcare commission and the, and the reimbursement work. And now um, I've come back to work on um, what I call a coaching solution for medical practices with a large team, more to come on that. That's um, just coming to fruition now. So, you know, when I look at all of this and most of it, and I have a coaching practice too, it's a heavy lift, you know, every day is a heavy lift and, um, and it's worth every, every effort because the joy you feel, and I, maybe it's because I'm an achiever and not everybody has this personality type, but the joy that you feel of building something from scratch that that's successful, it still has its ups and downs. You worry about it. You lose sleep over it. But um, it's just an amazing thing to have built. And I'm sure if Ann Nolte was here, she would say the same thing. When you look back, you know, I'm 66. I, I am still going strong. I'm sure I have at least another 10 years of heavy lifting. Hopefully I'll have the health and the brain power to do it. Um, but that that it has been hard and and it's also been worth every minute. Now, back to well coaches, just a couple things I want to say. One is when I started, um, the coaching competencies that existed were the ICF, International Coach Federation competencies, which have been re, um, redone uh, in the last few years and are a solid, um, base for what I call facilitative coaching, self-awareness, learning, and goal attainment. When I came on board, though, I could see right away, um, coming out of my biotech career, there was no science. There still is not enough science, very little attached to these competencies. That's We're still working on that. And um, so the next eight years were, you know, meeting DC and Ryan, the motivational interviewing folks. I worked with Jim Prochaska. Um, I went to all the early positive psychology conferences and met Marty Seligman and Cheek Semihai and all that gang. And so over the, those years, we, Well Coaches was really um, at the forefront of producing a science-based coaching protocol. Um, and, and then, but, but we, and then some of that we brought to MBHWC, you know, 10 years later, but we have much more than is in either ICF or MBHWC. If you've been through Well Coaches, you understand this. There's a much bigger toolbox. Um, we have really operationalized well-being, the science of well-being into coaching. Um, and then our kind of signature contribution is the generative moment. And that's where my some of my new work is. And then we're doing a lot more than that. Culture, equity, inclusion, mental well-being. Coaches are going to be pulled into the mental health um, process. And then, of course, social resources determinants, group coaching. So so building coaching competencies um, and, and taking that further is really about coaching excellence, having coaches be extremely skilled at what we do. And this is very important at this time of AI coming on board because Nikki Terblanche in South Africa, who is a, a, a computer scientist who's also a coach, has done one of the early studies comparing a chatbot to coaches. 
on one coaching process, which is goal setting. And he's shown, and I'm happy to send you the paper, he presented at our Harvard Medical School coaching conference last April, um, coaches and the digital chatbot were equal in efficacy in goal setting. That's very important for us to know because that means the basics of making habits, you know, what to do, when to do it, how often to do it, what's your backup plan, how are you going to prepare, how are you going to inch up your motivation and your confidence to make sure you do it at Wednesday morning or Thursday afternoon or Saturday, you know, when you get up, whatever, all of that is going to be taken over by AI. We're going to be responsible for the hard part, which is helping people really both change their mindsets and integrate the experiences that they're having that are in their way to their growth and their wholeness and their well-being. So coaching competencies matter and they're going to keep evolving. So when, when we were ready, we um, published with, because we were partnered with American College of Sports Medicine from the beginning, and they introduced us to Walters Kluwer, which is a medical publisher, and, and ACSM did the peer review. Um, we published our own uh, protocol, our, our own coaching curriculum. So, um, and uh, we really did put it out in the public domain. It remains to this day the backbone of the Well Coaches training, but it is now used all over the world in coach training programs. It's sold. We're just getting close to 50,000 copies. Um, and it's now evidence based because Well Coaches has 22 peer reviewed studies. There's a new one that was just accepted for publication. I was talking to Carrie Polamar McGrath at MGH this week. Um, it's a randomized control study in physician coaching for burnout with nice data. I saw the draft paper um, and it supported our, our work um, training coaches, but also every uh, in a lot of places. It's a key resource for the national board certification. I hear from coaches all the time that they, um, they depend on it for their prep. Um, it's cited by the American Medical Association, including a coaching book, Coaching and Medical Education, for which I'm an editor and chapter author, and it's been translated into Spanish and Mandarin. So this is a very, as, as, as Jim said, it's dog-eared. It's, um, it were, in fact, Erica and I are just working on the third edition, which will, the core won't change, we'll update the science, and we're going to add a few chapters. So um, it is, and it is standing the test of time. Now, at the Institute of Coaching, uh, we got started by our first conference in 2008, which is a Harvard Medical School, McLean and Institute of Coaching Conference. We've not been in person for five years, and we're going to be in Boston, May 3rd and 4th. Um, their well coaches will have a reception. There will be lots of, there will be a, a, a networking place for health and well-being coaching. And um, it's an amazing lineup. We were even able to attract Marty Seligman. Um, who's 81 um, and uh, to do, uh, he's winning our science award. Um, and so it's a wonderful, wonderful event. If you can save your pennies and, and um, join us in, in May, um, it's our 15th conference. Now, NBHWC. Okay, so I've talked about well coaches, talked about um, the Institute briefly, and then NBHWC. So the, the couple things I want to share is this was the early group of founders. This is um, um, our, our you know, can you believe I'm blanking on his name from ACSM? Richard, it'll come to me in a second. He was really key um, in the early days, helped us do our first job task analysis. Some of these folks you may know, Leanne at NBHWC. Um, this was our early gang. And we, uh, you see us here at a retreat in Arizona. It's actually at a, a ranch. We went there, um, I think three times to work on the standards. And um, we hammered them out. We were up late. We, we, we were... We worked so hard in getting those early standards in the first five years. And then we met MBME, um, and then we built the partnership here. Ruth Wolliver, who is one of you know my closest co uh, collaborators there, we, we Ruth and I worked very hard on the competency outline, the first one, and then um, led to the signs. This is our signing agreements. This is um, Peter Katsafrakis Katz at uh, president of MBA or second, she's CEO of MBME. So, so, you know, those early days were a lot of fun and um, so meaningful looking back. These are wonderful people that we all got to work together with. And then in 2019, we went, we marched off to Baltimore. We, we just met with CMS again in January, this time we didn't have to travel, but here we are in front of CMS in 2019. Then again, later in that year, this is Linda Lasobi, who was the 
executive director of NCHEC. We work closely together because health educators were already in the Affordable Care Act as a, um, as a health professional, and we put health educators and health and well-being coaches together for the purpose of policy. Um, and we got in front of CMS um, way back then, and then we came back um, uh, just in a couple of months ago. And that year, um, through actually the efforts of the VA and Dr. Kavitha Reddy, and with our help, um, we got the first uh, CPT co uh, codes for health and well-being coaching services, um, which are um, alive and well. Um, they were just been renewed for another five years. Um, and then Gary Sforzo at Well Coaches and I helped sh shepherd along. Um, so we've been tracking all of the literature since 2000, publishing two um, publications, the compendium and the addendum, and then another addendum. We're just we were just working on it now. There's a large team working on it for the most recent literature and that will keep going. And we have to keep track of all the literature because we've got to be able to show the policymakers that there is excellent um, uh, high quality studies showing that coaching is effective across a lot of diseases. And this is all the healthcare. There's lots of data in uh, employer wellness and community, but we have for, for policy purposes in healthcare, we have to focus on the healthcare settings. So we are uh, continuing to watch this literature. That's another big activity that Gary and I got started in 2015 or so and continues to grow. And then the big news last summer was that Medicare, um, so, you know, it's a, I won't go through the whole story, but um, the, the CPT panel, which is responsible for moving the CPT codes forward and CMS are not um, viewing the coaching codes in the same way at the moment. And the, the CPT panel, which is protective of the CPT codes in entirety and wants to avoid inflation, unnecessary codes. And so their view was that coaching processes services are already included in other CPT services. And to some extent, that's true. To a large extent, there are other codes. And we found that when we were gathering data. But Medicare um, and our, um, you know, the leaders at Medicare and CMS took a different view. And um, another group applied to have coaching services become a telehealth service. And that went forward um, and was uh, approved in November last year to start in 2024. And um, I led a delegation then that met, that met with CMS in January to put forward a plan um, because the, what they're asking for is published evidence using the CPT codes for coaching programs for Medicare beneficiaries. And so that's what I'm lining up now with partners um, to do that. It's gonna take a few years, but it will hopefully get the job done, show that coaching services work in healthcare settings for Medicare beneficiaries, which will hopefully lay the ground for reimbursement beyond um, Medicare. So that's the latest there. Okay, so now part three, coaching insights. So a peak moment for me recently was that the American College of Lifestyle Medicine asked me to do a keynote. It was the first coaching keynote at the American College of Lifestyle Medicine conference ever in November, 2022. And being a brave soul, I created a brand new talk, um, <laughs> which was a risk. And, um, and if you read all the reviews, um, you'll see that there are some people, maybe, you know, 10, 20% who didn't like it. And so, and that makes me feel bad. I have to tell you, I am someone who does like to get a, a appreciation, but I'm reminded of Todd Cashton, who's one of my, another favorite scientists who said to me, you know, or said to the group, you know, you really want to only get about 80% good responses because that means you're pushing the envelope. So, so that, that, that's what happened in this talk, but it, it forced me because of the pressure of standing on the stage with 2000 people in the audience and another thousand virtually is that I really did, you know, stretch myself to, to do this talk. And I'm going to talk about um, the things I said um, with another, you know, 18 months of reflection. So they may come across better than they did then, but it's, these are things that really matter to me around where we're going. Um, and, and so I, 
I use the, the uh, metaphor ground zero at some risk because ground zero reminds us of 9-11. And so we all have to kind of stop and, you know, feel the, the pain of that. But ground zero has other meanings too. And so I want to bring those alive. And um, I'm going to focus on the middle column here, but it's in, so that I don't miss the rest. What I did is I used a piece of music, um, Elgar's Nimrod, which is a four minute piece of um, beautiful symphony music that in its own way kind of depicts the arc of a life. Um, and so I encourage you to listen to that. I'm not gonna play it today. Um, and I can send you my favorite, one of my favorite um, performances of that. So that was one thing I talked about. And then I talked about social resources of health, which I'm gonna touch on now. When I talked about zero, I wanted us to realize in the coaching context that every moment is a beginning. Ground zero, it means the very beginning, square one. And so, you know, if you ask a question and you, you hit a stone, it doesn't go anywhere, or you, there's a little resistance, or it doesn't quite land the way you want, just know you can start again. There's a new beginning. Every moment is a new beginning. You take a breath, you recalibrate, and you come from a new place again. So. That's, I think, um, encouraging. Then from the perspective of an electrician, you know, the earth is grounding. So, so the electrical charge, you know, from like say lightning, um, the ground neutralizes the charge. And when we're at our best as coaches, people come in charged, right? Charged up, anxious, stressed, worried, overwhelmed, or down, sad, disappointed, um, and, and we create kind of a grounding space. I don't know whether there is a physics of this that we'll find at some, where somebody will discover, uh, maybe not in our lifetimes, but we are really grounding those electrical charges, those emotional charges, so people can be more present and be able to observe them rather than be controlled by them. And then I'll tell you about quantum criticality in a moment, which is the energy phase for um, potential and transformation. So let's then move on to the middle column. So, you know, my, my favorite coaching theory is self-determination theory. It is an empirical theory, which is distinct from positive psychology, which is a collection of constructs that are not really connected into a meta theory. They're really independent ideas and different positive psychology scholars work on different constructs. Self-determination theory is different in that it, it was developed um, empirically one step at a time over several decades. And the summary statement around it that is my favorite, it's on the self-determination theory website, is this. And, the, and I'm linking this to ground zero, ground here, and then potential being zero for potential. So people are active organisms with evolved tendencies toward growing, mastering ambient challenges and integrating new experiences into a coherent sense of self. We'll talk more about integrating, but what's important here is that we're naturally um, well resourced. We want to grow. We want to do hard things. We want to master challenges. We're curious. We go out in the world. We take risks. We have difficult experiences, and we integrate those into a coherent sense of self. We do. We turn adversity into strength. That's the basic, and that is a basic. Uh, process of well-being that isn't talked about a lot. We hear about it in post-traumatic growth, but this is it, that we take, we use the positive resources to give us the resources to take the difficult ones, the challenges, the obstacles, and integrate them into a bigger sense of self. The ground, the natural developmental tendencies don't operate automatically. They require ongoing social nutriments and supports. So without the right social resources, the right ground, you don't go forward and build a bigger, better, braver, more curious, open, expansive self. So because we don't have this good social ground for many of us, um, coaching is needed. If we did, we wouldn't need it. But we are today the social nutriment that allows people to do what is natural. We're not doing anything that doesn't already happen. We're just providing the nutrients for something that is the natural order of human evolution. 
Now then Abraham Maslow and his self-actualizing theory was or the original theory for motivation, but it's now been replaced by self-determination theory, but it had some other pieces that are worth sharing. And Stuart Barry Kaufman, or sorry, Scott Barry Kaufman has done a fabulous job in his book, um, Transcend of connecting and some research, connecting the latest research to the original observational work of Maslow. And the two things that I'm sharing here are that each human has two sets of forces. So there's the boat here, the sailboat. The hull is the, is the ground and the sail is the potential. So the ground is safety, connection, self-esteem, stability, security, the stuff that keeps us stable. And then the growth is here. So basically then um, Maslow talks about the ground um, as one, so one set of forces here. If we're not stable, we then are looking for safety we're defensive out of fear. We regress. We hang on to the past, afraid to take chances, afraid to jeopardize what one has, afraid of independence, freedom, and separatism. Okay, we all have moments like that. The, the, the pandemic pulled all of that out of all of us. But for some people, this is a day in, day out experience, especially if they have a low level of social resources. So, the, so sometimes as coaches, we need to step in using coaching skills to stabilize a little bit. And that's important, especially in this era of equity and inclusion and, and addressing the, um, the, the folks with fewer social resources. So we have a new role to play in, in certain contexts where we're helping to stabilize. Then the potential, once the stability is there, impels us forward to our wholeness and uniqueness and full functioning and confidence. Um, and that the basic conflict for humans is between the defensive resources to say forces to say stay stable and secure and then the growth trends and that that's an existential thing and that we should welcome it and recognize that we're going to have these dark parts of us come up over our lives in fact you know the the, the more mature you are the more likely they're going to to come out and you're going to find yourself finding fears that you never had or concerns that you never had so this is this is the reality of humans is that we've got these two forces and um, we need to address these as coaches. Okay, so that's the state of humans. Plenty of potential, but you need the stability first. Okay, now we're coaches and or, or helping professionals. And um, this new work by Lisa Fel Felman Barrett is in, the re in recent years. Um, we have some great talks by her at the Institute of Coaching on how emotions are made. There are textbooks on emotional theories and this is the latest and it's profound. Um, basically, our brains are automatically and continuously assessing, monitoring, assessing, and predicting, monitoring the environment, monitoring our internal environment, looking for the demands on us internally and externally, the resources we have internally and externally, our needs, and then across multiple dimensions of our lives at the same time, amazing computing going on in our brains. And then the brain wants to let us know about all this. So it sends us emotions, which turn into thoughts, and then drive all that mental activity in the frontal cortex. And so our emotions are being made continuously by our brains. And then the purpose of them is to either do something or to learn or to integrate right? So they have a purpose. They're not just passing clouds. There's a reason for them. The brain wants us to experience them, to feel them, to process them, and to integrate them. Okay, but here's the, the rub. The brain is making all those predictions based on what's already in our memories. It's only drawing on our past. It's actually not automatically discerning the current moment, the reality in front of us. So it might be out of date or it might not be relevant to what the reality of the moment is. So what that means is that when we're experiencing our brain's reality, because it's constant, right? That stream of thoughts and emotions that you've got all the time, you're not in touch with the moment and the reality in front of you. You're, you're actually not 
sensing it. So you have to move into your senses and out of your brain that's full of activity. And the way I like to think about it is that if you think about virtual reality, virtual reality glasses, if you took a broom, little, you know, little sweeping broom and swept all your mental activity into these glasses and put them down, then you can feel the present moment. You can just experience it through your senses. And when you start from that place, you're actually in touch with reality and the emotions and thoughts are not in the way. And that is the start of any good conversation, including a coaching conversation, because you're fully here and fully present. Then we have uh, our needs, which are big drivers of all that mental activity that we need to be aware of in particular. So another piece of self-determination theory, there's three primary needs. Um, autonomy, which is I want to be in charge of myself. I want to live by, own, my, by my own values. I want to have the freedom to choose the life I want. And then I want to grow my competence, my mastery of my environment. And then I want relationships to support both of those things. Those are my primary needs without which I um, languish. But when we express those needs as helping professionals our own needs, we come from our own values, so we judge others. We come from our own competence and we give people the answer and hand them the list and want to fix. And we come from our own needs to help. And so then we rescue rather than letting people, help, uh, helping them figure it out for themselves. So also what we're setting down on these virtual reality glasses is ourselves, our needs in the moment, only for the coaching conversation or help. You don't, you can put your needs back on track when you come, we, we still have those needs. So we still wanna live um, um, have parts of our lives where we're serving those needs. But when we're with other people, we need to serve them too, unless it's not a, you know, unless it's not a helping relationship. So that's a big part of what drives our mental activity. And fortunately, our minds come with a lot of other functions installed. You know, we have the ability to accept things as they are, not condone them, not hope for better, but to be at peace with where they are right now. We are benevolent. We can put people's uh, interests um, first. We can feel their feelings. We can bring a sense of purpose. We can bring creativity, we can help them find clarity when they're overwhelmed. We can bring our confidence in our work. And then of course, we can transcend all of this with just a deep gratitude that we get to do this work. So the next thing then when we're coaching, so I've been talking a little bit about what we need to set aside before we can start coaching. Um, I'm presenting social determinants of health as sort of the ground, the ground of our lives. And we're not digging down to the deepest levels here. That's not possible. We don't have the shovels, the tools to do that. But what we are doing is tilling the surface, you know, generating more energy, little sunshine, little fertilizer, little um, water, um, and um, to, to really help people have more resources in the moment. And for that, for that purpose, really coaches are a social resource. We are contributing social resources when people lack social resources for their health. What we're doing when we're tilling the ground is drawing out all these different aspects of well-being that come through um, in coaching, motivation, compassion, psychological resources, competence, setting goals, making habits. And in that way, we are cultivating all these resources and tilling the ground and cultivating. So that's that's a big part of what the coaching conversation is all about. And then we get to the integration. You know, what is, what is ripe right now? Um, what's unresolved? What is the, the thing that's in the way that if you could integrate it, transcend it, generate new insights, aha moments, translate that into action that would make a difference. That's the generative moment. And that's something that well coaches um, put on the map. Um, and a team of us created a theory even early 2000s, a long time ago in the, mid, in the middle 2000s. So this is actually um, my last slide on scientific insights coaching insights, which has to do with integration. 
I'm putting two things together. Um, I'm putting together first the work of quantum biologists, in particular, Stuart Kaufman. I went to Science of Consciousness conference a few years ago, and Dan Siegel, um, who is a psychiatrist and um, has, with team, defined the mind. He's one of the only people that has tried to do that. And he also talks a lot about integration. So it, from the physics perspective, um, there's this notion and it's depicted by zero. Um, there's a, an energy state called quantum criticality, which is considered the energy state of potential. And um, you won't hear about this in lectures by physicists or quantum biologists who are basically either biologists that have become physicists or physicists that have become biologists. But this some early work that um, that Dr. Kaufman did with with um, I think it's Gav Gavr um, Vate um, was who's a cancer researcher. They um, discovered that this particular energy state is present in um, a lot of proteins, but it's not present in an inanimate matter. So it's thought that it might be involved in consciousness. And that it is a it is the energy state for transition. So transition from one state to the next. So think about it as being the energy of potential transformation that's always present. Just think about it that way. That in if you're present to the reality of the moment with another person or yourself, there is this potential for transformation that you're tuning into because it's there. And then Dan Siegel um, in his book Mind site has a whole bunch of chapters on different kinds of integration. And basically integration is taking the unresolved, all the charged emotions, you know, I can't do this. I don't want to do this. I don't like this. Don't make me do this. You know, this is hard. All of all the charged emotions are basically unresolved energy states. And the integration is turning the unresolved into resolved. And, and in the brain, it's likely that one neural network that's kind of stuck in the I can't do this trench is looking for another neural network that says, well, perhaps I could do it, look at it this way. And the integration is the connection of those two networks that happens behind the right ear. And this has been shown as the, the nonlinear association here. This has been shown with a coaching study putting EEG headsets on coaching clients and then having them press a button when they have an insight. And four seconds before they press the button, there's a lighting up of that region of nonlinear association, as if the neural networks have just connected and it's turned into an aha moment. So that is the generative moment that well coaches worked on so hard in those early years. But I'm taking it further to say, I think this is integration and I think it can be done. And I have a, a mindful hack that I, I, I did in the talk, which you can listen to the keynote. And if you've taken the Well Coaches courses, you know all about this. So that is that is what we're here to do. That's not likely to be done by AI, by chatbots. You're not likely to be able to sense the potential for transformation, potential for unresolved to resolved through technology, through um, a, a computer. This is likely to be something that happens to the human brain that's going to be hard to replicate. So back to the personal. Here I am at age two um, <laughs> on the farm and um, tilling the ground. Um, and I show you this because um, I love to drive. And I, it took me till age eight to convince my dad to, that I could drive this tractor, which I did. Learned a stick shift. And, um, and so this is for me, an, a reminder of continuing to move forward, no matter what you're driving and by how old it is. And, um, and then at age 15, I was a cheerleader right here, as you can probably tell. And there's a good amount of coaching that is being a cheerleader. And so I've carried that through from today. And the last, here's me thriving um, in Australia on the, the bridge in Sydney. Um, which is what we're all here to do. And we as coaches want to model that. And with that, I want to say thank you. Thank you to Ann Nolte for all her work. Thank you to Anne for her scholar awards. And thank you to 
ISU and Jim for honoring me today. <laughs>